Let me press the record button, which we are now recording. Excellent. My name is Lindsay Glassner. I am the outreach coordinator at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Births with K-12 program. Tonight, monitoring a chat window and sharing all of our wonderful, helpful links is Kelly Schaefer, who is the education specialist with Bird Sleuth. The two of us will be talking about and sharing resources of gardening for birds. So thank you for joining us tonight. Before we begin, I want to run a quick poll just to see uh, who our audience is and curious what, uh, what brought you guys this webinar. So it's just one question. And I just want you guys to select a statement that best describes you. You can select multiple statements, but specifically uh, talking to you and learning about your educational site and why you're interested in gardening at your educational site. So I'm gonna let you guys vote real quick and then we'll proceed from there. Excellent. And you guys feel free to share your garden opportunities in the chat window. Sarah will have everybody introduce themselves shortly. It's looking like I can share these results for you guys. It's looking like many of you uh, don't actually currently have a garden at your school or educational site around seven of you. Some of you have a old or neglected garden. That actually seems to be fairly common with many educators that we work with who they had a garden, but unfortunately due to funding or the champion teacher who started it left, um, that's one option that could have led to a, an older out of use garden. Some of you, many of you have a vegetable or food garden. A few of you have a pollinator or wildlife garden and others have the other category, which you can share in the chat window. So for tonight's webinar, we are talking about gardening for birds. And just to talk about a few logistical things, some of you may be new to this platform, Zoom. I recognize a few of you who have been joining us for all of our monthly webinars. Thanks for coming back out again. For those of you who are new, um, I do recommend going, exiting the full screen option and opening up the chat window on the right hand side. That chat window is where Kelly will be sharing all the helpful uh, links that I'll be talking about in this webinar, as well as for you guys to share any thoughts, ideas, read what other people are doing, share other links. Um, you will be muted throughout the webinar, but that chat window is an opportunity for you guys to collaborate with each other uh, of sharing ideas and resources. In the chat window, please make sure you, in that two button, you're sending to everyone. That way, any information can be shared with everybody. If you do have specific concerns that you only want to talk to Kelly or myself about, you can select all panelists. If not, I do recommend selecting to everyone. So let's test out that chat window. And if you could, please tell us where you're from and what your role is as an educator. And if you'd like, feel free to share any information about your garden. Oh, Sarah, that's how you know about our wonderful weather. Yes, for those of you who aren't Sarah and I in beautiful Ithaca, New York, we are currently experiencing a wonderful, wonderful storm, a blizzard, basically. So yes, that's what's happening here. Actually, I'm a little terrified whether I can leave the parking lot after today. So <laughs> this will be a fun adventure. Uh, Yvonne, yes, so the links, what we'll be doing, the chat window, we won't actually make all the chat window public of the conversations, but all the links we will be sharing in the chat window, where we will be posting this recording live to our YouTube channel, and we will put all these supplemental links in that YouTube channel. So looking at some of our educators, we have a diverse, we're looking for native gardening, we're looking at uh, people doing nature preserves. 
Canada, Ohio, West Virginia, Sycamore, Illinois, uh, Houston. Oh, I'd love to be in Houston right now. Lots and lots of snow. Yes, Kelly, we have lots and lots of snow. Phelps, New York. Donna, are you getting any snow there? Oh, Sarah, you're a speech therapist in Ithaca. You may know my mom. She's also a speech therapist here. Uh, kindergarten teachers, volunteer educators, homeschool families, zoo coordinators. We have a diverse audience here. Yeah, Donna, you're getting snow as well. Mm. We're all getting hit hard in this Northeast area. Renee having a small vegetable, some flower beds, a natural area. Wow, you guys have a beautiful setup, it sounds like. Excellent. So glad everybody was able to utilize the chat window. Feel free to share any thoughts, recommendations, uh, collaborate with each other in that chat window. Or especially if you're in Houston, send us wonderful sunny pictures. We could use that right now in Ithaca, New York. So let's continue on and introduce you guys to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I wish this is what we look like right now, but unfortunately we are completely covered in snow. But at the lab, our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. And specifically, Kelly and myself are with the K through 12 program called Bird Sleuth. So we take all of the knowledge and research that's happening here at the lab and create innovative resources and training opportunities that are building science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Again, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I'll be your presenter tonight, but Kelly will be in the chat window. Uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to post them in the chat window. I'll try my best to keep up to date with them, but Kelly will answer all the questions there and will flag me if I should address any questions to the entire group. Now in this webinar tonight, Gardening for Birds, we're going to talk about a few things and we will be focusing on the strategies to consider when planning and creating a garden, highlighting some simple actions to take to make your garden more bird friendly. We'll address some challenges you may face when creating a garden, but we'll finally provide examples of how your garden is a marvelous educational tool for citizen science. So let's get started. Uh, when we first were uh, addressing the concept of gardening at the Lab of Ornithology with our education program, we were a little skeptical, you know, how can gardening be related with birds? And we realized that there truly is a natural connection, uh, that if you are providing native plants and natural habitat in your schoolyard, you're naturally attracting birds to that habitat. And that's where we want to focus on. So. Uh, two years ago, we started we being the Birds with K-12 program, started a sponsorship with Alaska Fertilizer. It's a uh, fish emulsion organic fertilizer that they have been, with the support of Alaska Fertilizer, they've been able to provide us garden grants for the last two years. So we've been able to distribute $24,000 to 10 schools across the United States, and we are looking to continue that garden grant series in the hopes of really helping schools not only create and develop vegetable gardens, but also to uh, help those and develop those vegetable gardens to become uh, pollinator gardens, uh, rain barrel gardens, conservation gardens, but gardens that are helping local habitat and birds. Now, with these 20 educators we've been working with thus far, we've gone back and talked with them about what creates a successful garden. What advice would they have for teachers or educators who may be starting out around this? And this developed a blog post, which I'll have Kelly share that blog post in the chat window, called Ensuring Garden Success. And I wanna highlight a few points to ensure garden success before we really dive into the bird aspect. Now, especially since some of you, the majority of you stated that you actually don't have a garden at all and are looking to start from scratch. 
there are some very helpful pieces of advice that I wouldn't even have considered when thinking about starting a garden. The very first step, especially for those of you starting from scratch, is to ensure you have full approval from all the stakeholders involved in the gardening process. This may include uh, talking to district staff. This may getting uh, approval from your principal. You may need to talk to any community members or parent teachers associations. But specifically, and, and probably the most important, is to make sure you have the approval and support of any maintenance staff. And that's where we also go into going hand in hand with getting staff support as well. Not just seeking the approval, but also gaining the support and backup from your fellow teachers, from your fellow educators, from the community, from other maintenance staff. We have learned from our teachers that we've spoken with that oftentimes many of them came to us and they were trying to rehabilitate an old or forgotten garden and it was old or forgotten because there was one garden champion a teacher who did all the necessary work for the garden but only her students utilized and accessed the garden though it was great for those students as soon as the teacher um, left or lost funding then the garden went on the wayside and that's where gaining staff support uh, trying to implement the garden into multiple classrooms multiple grade ranges uh, embedding it within your community or with a parent teacher association that is key to ensuring the success of your garden and again I'm going to reiterate this having maintenance staff support is vital. We've also had experiences of educators telling us horror stories, unfortunately, where they may have planted a native pollinator garden or native grasses or prairie garden. And unfortunately, without the maintenance staff being aware or on board with the situation, those gardens were destroyed, oftentimes mowed over completely. And it was a complete loss of habitat, complete devastation on the teacher's part. And that's where having the maintenance staff is incredibly important to have their support, uh, not only during the school year, but potentially during the summertime too. They may be on the grounds and may be able to help you during the summer hours when, when things may get a little hot. So with the ensuring garden success, the first two steps are making sure you have approval, but also getting staff support. From there, it's all about choosing your location, and location is ideal. At the Lab of Ornithology, the Nature Conservancy is a partner with the Cornell Lab through our Habitat Network Project. But they also have a series of incredible uh, how-to garden videos. And I wanna show you just a highlight from the planning your garden video. And hopefully, I assume the sound should work. So you want to build a garden. Getting from plan to planting is pretty straightforward. But how do you get from no plan to plan? Of the who, what, where, when, why, and how, the where is probably the most important. So when designing your garden, you want to consider the actual physical space. Is this space a sunny space, a very, very shady space, or is it somewhere in between? Location, location, location. Take the time to look at a site at different times of the day because you don't want to plant where the sun doesn't shine. There might be a building nearby that casts a shadow in the afternoon. If you start to plan your garden in the winter, like most of us do, the trees aren't fully leafed out, and in the summer and spring, they're going to get broader and cast more of a shadow. If you do choose a space with very light, just make sure that you have plants in that space that are going to benefit from that type of light. Okay, have sunlight, need water. It's important to have a consistent source of water. We assume it will rain throughout the year, but there are times of the year when it's raining less. You can always create water catchment systems such as rain barrels, plant plants that are more drought resistant, but you still need something for those summers when it might not rain for a month. With sunlight and water sorted, let's talk soil. Another thing to consider is the actual lay of the ground. But when you have a really strong rainstorm in the summer, even a slight slant is going to create a certain type of runoff 
a lot of things might wash out of your garden, including the soil that you work so hard to cultivate. Safeguard everyone's hard work with barriers and other structures to keep things in place. Safeguard the soil because it's your plant's home and part of its food supply. It's important to understand the soil that you're going to plant in your garden. You dig into the ground, but what does that soil look like? Is it really heavy and full of clay? Is it very sandy soil? In general, you want to consider how your soil can be a good balance of the sand, the silt, and the clay. When it comes to gardens, it's all about your geography. So again, that was just a very short clip from this five minute video all around planning your garden. Now, the Nature Conservancy, their garden grant program for schools is called Nature Works Everywhere. I'm going to have Kelly share the link with that garden grant program in the chat window. But whether you're part of the grant or not, you have access to a variety of lesson plans as well as these educational how-to videos. Uh, spore gardening. Though they don't have a bird specific video, uh, I'm going to try and work with them and see if we can get something like that happening. But they do have a, a wealth of resources I highly recommend looking into. And this video brought up three really good points when choosing your location. The first is to consider sunlight. Uh, as they mentioned, do you have a building that or as the afternoon progresses would cause shade to go over part of your garden area that you're looking at? Are there trees around that may cause shade? Do you actually have a significant amount of light? And based on that sunlight will help you dictate uh, and choose the best plants for, those, uh, for the sunlight base. Another consideration is water especially if you are at a school and may be depending on water sources from the school. I also encountered another horror story from a school where they got all set up, they built their raised garden beds, they were planting everything, and as soon as they went to water all their plants, they realized that the faucet was not accessible for where the garden was. It was actually on the opposite side of the building, and so they had to refill buckets of water every single time they had to go water their plants instead of just having a faucet nearby. Eventually they came up with an alternative solution, built rain barrels, but just considering the water location as well. Do you have easel, easy water accessibility? Do you live in a climate where water is not an issue at all? Or do you live in a climate, maybe a desert area where, yes, it's very arid, you need to consider water. And then the final one is soil as well. That's also a big factor. Uh, maybe your soil has toxins and you need to implement a raised garden bed, or you have very uh, wet and um, damp soil, maybe you're near a wetland area. Trying to think about those three components of water, sunlight, and soil when choosing your location for your garden. And the next big thing that goes hand in hand with location is considering your climate. Again, I mentioned uh, arid climate, looking for plants that have been adapted to arid climates that need less water, that are drought resistant, or um, looking, especially if you're like in Ithaca, New York, when we're working in gardenings in my mom's area, looking for perennial versus annual bulbs. Do we want to keep replanting things or do we want to consider plants that uh, may still produce berries during the winter time as a food source for birds. These are all different considerations we need to think about when choosing the location and considering your climate. Um, it was really funny when I was actually working with a Texas teacher last, last spring and the whole considering their climate came up because being in Texas they hardly get any rainfall but last spring in Texas they were flooded with rain over and over and actually prevented them from building their garden last spring, which was unfortunate, but that's another way to consider your climate. So there are, once you've started this planning process, you want to, maybe you've already thinking about the garden or you maybe already have a garden or you want to just start from scratch, but you want to start making your garden bird friendly. So in the chat window, this is what the whole purpose of this webinar is, is how to make your gardens bird friendly. And, and I wonder if you guys already have some ideas on how to do so. So in the chat window, if you could share any ideas you have on how to make the garden bird friendly, I'd love to hear them right now.
Yes, Ellen, adding water for birds. Having feeders, having local plants, providing a birdhouse. Native plants, especially ones with berry in the winter, plant native plants. Strike prevention windows near the garden, potentially. Having barrier nectar producing shrubs. Plant structure for some nets, absolutely. So you guys are coming up with a lot of uh, ideas that we have listed as well on our website of how to help birds. Um, when we created this list, it was just general backyard habitats, but I think many of these will also apply to a schoolyard, uh, especially community gardens. So the first biggest one we really want to mention is trying to avoid having any kind of free roaming cats. This can be uh, an opportunity for the youth that you work with to start taking community action and potentially starting a campaign promoting uh, indoor cats, taking the cats inside uh, during the nesting season, especially the nesting and the breeding season for birds, because cats can kill a lot of birds during those two time periods. And gardens are an ideal opportunity if, we're, if you're attracting birds to your garden. Providing a bird bath, Ellen, I know you mentioned adding water, having a bird bath or some kind of water source for the birds. Leaving leaf litter uh, left on the site. Having that leaf litter is a wonderful opportunity to help revitalize and ex uh, provide extra nutrients into your garden, but also providing a, a home and housing opportunity for na native insects and plants that could uh, provide food sources for your birds. A snag, for those of you who aren't familiar with the word snag, a snag is a dead tree. Oftentimes people will take down these snags in the thoughts that they are an eyesore, they are ugly, so to say, but snags or dead trees are actually providing a great opportunity for bugs to eat out the dead rotting tree, but then provide food sources and nesting opportunities for birds as well. Providing nest boxes, many of you mentioned those, having a pond, stream, or other water area if you want to make more natural instead of a bird bath. Uh, no use of herbicides or pesticides. Again, those are toxins and those go right up the food chain to birds. And then as many of you mentioned, providing native plants. And that's gonna be our main focus for uh, this middle part of our webinar is why native plants are so important for birds. So, the why native plants. There are many reasons to choose native plants. Chances are there are several reasons that will appeal to you when using natives in your outdoor spaces. Uh, they can create a sanctuary to support and encourage thriving wildlife, but they also have direct and positive impacts that you can have on the environment and your community. You may be uh, likely to spend less time on maintenance, on activities like mowing, raking, watering, and trimming. You can reduce your irrigation needs and higher survival rates with native plants, especially during the drought, since they are already adapted to that climate. You might also find yourself buying fewer replacement plants each year and saving money on water bills. But people also tend to utilize fewer chemicals to eliminate pests or promote growth in a native garden. And that translates to cleaner runoff and safer water supplies and less chemical exposure for you, your students, and your community. So when we think of these native plants, again, you're highlighting the low maintenance, you're saving on energy and money, you're supporting wildlife, you have cleaner water, um, and that cleaner opportunity helps you connect with nature. But the specific connection between native plants uh, and pollinators is a really significant connection. And oftentimes, the schools we work with are specifically focusing on creating pollinator gardens to attract birds. So what's that relationship between plants and pollinators? Some insects have a strong preference for the native plants of the region. It might seem like a plant is a plant, but research suggests that the co-evolution of insects and plants in shared ecosystems 
means that many insects, uh, up to 90% of plant-eating insects, have developed special relationships with particular plants, uh, like the seasonal timing of development, specialized mouth parts, uh, resistance to toxins and other chemicals were produced by the plant. Whereas when you have introduced or non-native plants, those are relatively new to an ecosystem. They haven't been uh, developing a relationship with the insects over those millions of years like native plants. And so these introduced or non-native plants may have some of the same characteristics that make them compatible to native fauna. As a result, insects and sometimes other wildlife, they're unable to eat or breed on introduced plants with the same success. And so decades of empirical studies show that most insects or other invertebrates which feed on plants are restricted to eating vegetation from plant lineages with which they share an evolutionary history. Basically, butterflies, moths, and other herbivorous insects have evolved to eat specific native plants. So ecosystems with more introduced species have shown reduced biodiversity and biomass, both at the herbivorous and insectivorous predatory levels. Let's give you an example then. Uh, the Lepidoptera, it's a group of insects we know as caterpillars. The Lepidoptera are one of the foundational herbivorous species that are occurring across ecosystems with a diversity of plant hosts. The top three plant hosts for Lepidoptera are trees in the Mid-Atlantic region. These trees are oak, cherry and plum, and willow. So if you are just standing under an oak tree, imagine how many caterpillars live within the branches of that oak tree. Just like a healthy food web where you find insects like butterflies and moths, you also find species that feed upon these insects like birds, mammals, and reptiles. So let's take our chickadee. A chickadee pictured here, they require between 5,000 to 8,000 caterpillars per nesting brood. And a brood is um, one nesting cycle. And they tend to have two brood attempts per spring and summer. So that, that nesting season, they might have two broods. And this is 5,000 to 8,000 caterpillars per brood. That's up to 16,000 caterpillars they may need during the entire nesting season. Without native plants as the primary food source and habitat, Diversity in an ecosystem can be drastically reduced. So this, uh, there was a study conducted at the University of Delaware, and it showed yards with native landscaping not only having a, a greater total number of birds, but also greater diversity of bird species compared to properties with non-native plants. The researchers speculate the birds were actually attracted to the native yards because there was an increased uh, area where there was a diversity of caterpillars in the native plant sites compared to the non-native plant sites. Ultimately, what that study has shown and what the concept of native plants can help us with is having native plants increases are native insects, which helps the food web and ecosystem, including our birds. And that study by the University of Delaware ultimately shows that even densely populated areas can have an impact on conservation and biodiversity by having native landscapes. And that's really the biggest theme of why you want to have native plants. They are going to help your biodiversity overall, whether you're looking at insects, whether you're looking at birds, whether you're just looking at plants, doesn't matter. Native plants will increase your biodiversity, and that's what we're really focusing on here. Yes, uh, Janet, I highly agree. Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, that was actually some of our sources where we're getting a lot of these facts. He's an amazing researcher.
So real quick, are there any questions at all about why native plants are important? I'm gonna look through the chat window real quick. A lot of this was very research-based, but I wanna make sure that you guys take the point home that that's gonna be your biggest step is to really realize that native plants are the key. Vaughn, it's like I just paid you to do that. So how do we find our local native plants? Well, that is a perfect question and that's just gonna transition right into our next slides. So the transitioning to native plants, um, the first things first, before we even start thinking about how to find native plants, we need to start preparing your habitat for native plants. The first thing that you really wanna do is remove invasive trees, shrubs, weeds, but making room for those native plants. Um, invasive species, they get the name invasive because they are truly invading uh, native plant areas. Now there's non-native plants and invasive species are just a category of non-native plants. Invasive ones are where they truly will take over your garden. So you want to remove those invasive species to give room for your native plants to come in. You want to reduce the size of your lawn. Most grass in our lawns that we have at our schools, our educational sites, our backyards, those are not native plant lawns. Uh, you can actually have a native lawn filled with native grasses, but again, you need to remove the invasive species out of those. One method of doing so would be uh, smothering your lawn, and that's by laying down a bunch of newspaper and mulch on top of that newspaper in the fall, and then planting either native grasses for your lawn or just native plants in your garden uh, in the springtime. Another step you can do to start transitioning towards native plants is making better selections, uh, like going to your uh, local nurseries to find native plants. And then growing those native plants, uh, potentially through container gardening. This allows you to control the soil types, moisture levels, sun exposure, to grow an incredible variety of native species in any location. Um, so that's another opportunity through container gardening. Now let's ask, answer your question, Yvonne, and go through the process of how can we actually learn about some of the native plants. Now I'm going to introduce you guys to Habitat Network. The Habitat Network is a project that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Nature Conservancy are partnering with. It's not only a citizen science project, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's also an incredibly, incredibly useful website to provide you a variety of resources and information. So let me get on to my desktop. Now the website that you'll be using, you can just type in yardmap.org. Kelly will share the URL in the chat window. But this is Habitat Network here. Again, you can see it's a partnership between the Nature Conservancy and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the goal of Habitat Network is to really try and have you, your community, your neighbors, your educational sites start to take actions by mapping, uh, um, digitally mapping your sites based off of what plants are in there, how many of them are native, how much of it is permeable versus impermeable uh, sites, et cetera. But we're specifically gonna look at how to uh, learn about your specific region. So you guys can look at me here. Let me make sure, Kelly, you guys can see my screen, right? I just wanna make sure everybody can see my screen. You're seeing Habitat Network? Yes, excellent. Okay. so. In Habitat Network here, you'll see my mouse is over the Explore tab. We're going to click on Explore, and you'll come right to this home page. Uh, this home page here will show you some feature sites of beautiful sites that have been mapped to Habitat Network. You can look at other schools, like this Montessori school here in Lake Illinois. Um, people's nature preserves. Sometimes you might have backyards that you're looking at. Uh, but these are future sites. What we're going to focus on is this left-hand section, your local resources. Let me, 
the spotlight. Okay, your local resources. And this is where you have the opportunity to determine what is your ecoregion? Who are your pollinators? What are your native plants? And who are your local experts that you can talk to? And this is where you're gonna enter in your zip code below. So in Ithaca, New York, our zip code is 14850. And let's see what our zip code has in store for us. Now this will tell me exactly what my ecoregion is, Laurentian Mixed Forest Province. And I'll show you where this is actually, this ecoregion exists in other locations as well. An ecoregion, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a unique combination of living and non-living factors that set your landscape apart and determine what will flourish there. If we scroll further down, uh, ultimately the ecoregion will help decide uh, what wildlife is best suited for your backyard. So we can see we have a full pollinator guide for our ecoregion. And I can click on this here. And it'll pop up this PDF right away of all the pollinators that are native and designed for our ecoregion. And I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom of this because this is where I find it's most helpful. This is a breakdown chart of the botanical name, the common name, um, the color, the height, the flowering season, the sun they need, the soil they need, and who are the pollinators they visit. And this is a true breakdown of all the perennial flowers, the um, trees and shrubs that are designed specifically for your ecoregion that will attract pollinators. This is a great starting point for you to go through. And this will highlight specifically bee pollinated gardens, um, crops that you can utilize, looking at the different types of pollinators we have, uh, including hummingbirds as well. I mean, that's a pollinator too. And so this will give you a basic summary of who are your pollinators, why to add native plants, and which native plants to choose. So that is one starting point, and that is your technically your pollinator guide for the ecoregion. You can also look through uh, your bird sightings of what birds are in your area. And if you aren't sure what technically your native plants are, you can search your native plants by your state right here. So wildflower.org will show me what our native plants are for New York State. Um, I can search general appearances, I can search lifespan, I can narrow down my search based off of shade, dry, moist, wet, whatever my soil and sunlight. I can do based off of the timing I want. You know, if you want a colorful garden, many kids like to create a rainbow garden, so to say. You can do bloom colors. Um, the height, uh, leaf arrangement, leaf retention, again, this will give you a whole opportunity to search the native species in your area. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you are going through the gardening process, get your students involved, especially if they're old enough, they should be the ones using this site and doing the research. They should be the ones deciding what plants do we wanna choose and going through that research opportunity because that's a once in a lifetime learning opportunity for them that will build that connection to their backyard and see the impact of the plants that they chose out growing and attracting pollinators and attracting wildlife. It's a, a truly wonderful thing. So along this as well, we have the state's native plants, but then you can also search native plant nurseries near you. So based off of my specific zip code in Ithaca, New York, I can see what local nurseries are near me that provide native plants. So Amandas Garden, um, it actually has 100% native plants. They only sell native plants, which is a wonderful opportunity. I can look at seed companies that are near here and see which ones have native plants. Uh, I can look at landscaping professionals, environmental consultants. These are all opportunities to look through and see who are your local resources and local experts. And especially for an educational setting, 
see if you could contact any of these local nurseries and they might be able to donate any plants to you or uh, come in and talk with the students of the significance of plants and help you design your garden. So that's really the basic starting point of answering what, how do you decide your native plants? Now, going from there, we can then look at, okay, we have, we know we want to do native plants, but let's continue on and figure out, let's learn a little more. How do we then go from the native plants to deciding which native plants are for which birds? And I just clicked on the learn tab here and at the top, uh, they have a whole series of blog posts around different topics. There is a native plant blog post section that you can look through and um, look at winter berries for wintering birds, seeds, glorious native seeds, eight reasons to plant something new, um, native landscaping uh, 101, features of vlogs, native trees, shrubs, but they also have a topic here on birds specifically. And right at the top here, the top bird articles, the one I highly recommend is which birds, which plants. So let's click on that one. Now the which birds, which plants is designed for you to do a search for your general area. So your region, uh, we are in the East Coast, so I'm gonna click East. And you can look at just a general slew of birds like uh, our pileated woodpecker. I think they're absolutely stunning and I would love to have more pileated woodpeckers in my area. So what I can do is click on the pileated woodpecker, this automatically pops up, and it will tell me that they are insect eaters, primarily carpenter ants and wood boring beetle larvae, but they also eat fruits of service berry, blackberry, wild strawberry, elderberry, hackberry, and red mulberry. And so right there I can see, okay, these are the types of plants that I can use right here in my garden if I want to try and attract more pileated woodpeckers. I can also look at my basic background knowledge of woodpeckers and think they're looking for carpenter ants and wood boring beetle larvae. So they're going to want to have a dead tree or a snag uh, in that general vicinity to potentially attract more pileated woodpeckers. Um, we can also sort, maybe you already have a garden established and you know you have uh, some, you know you have berries out in your garden. So let's look at some of the birds that may be attracted to some of the berries, like our tufted titmouse here. Though they mainly eat insects in the summer, they are also eating fruits of bayberry, elderberry, hackberry, and serviceberry. Hmm, we're seeing some trends here of the elderberries, hackberries, serviceberries, and getting to know what some of these trees and plants are. And we can click on many of these and see the specific database of the service berries. What are the service berries? Where are the service berries native to? Um, so we can see that they are, do have a native status here in the United States. We can look at different images. We can look at the plant characteristics, blooming information, where they're distributed, etc. So this is where we're going through all these processes of choosing the right bird or choosing the right plant for the bird. Okay, now that is just a very, very simple snapshot into the native plants and the resources through the Habitat Network. I'm going to pause real quick and see if there are any questions that you guys may have just on some of these features or anything on, around Habitat Network. Okay, I'll keep a look at the chat window. I'm gonna transition back to our PowerPoint. Um, can everybody see the PowerPoint again? Excellent. So, Using many of the tools we've mentioned uh, through Habitat Network and 
the ensuring the success that we've talked about those garden posts birds who has compiled a lot of this information on our website as well uh, just the general starting points for ensuring garden success and that would be under uh, birds who school gardening um, blog content kelly can you share the url to that please in the chat window but ultimately what we are looking for is an opportunity for you to discuss how to make the garden a successful teaching area and that's where especially when you have to try and seek approval from uh, your district your principal etc you want to make sure not only are you benefiting local wildlife by planting native plants in your garden but you are also creating a very valuable teaching opportunity for your students. And that's why I really emphasize, you wanna have the youth you're working with go through the process of doing the research, especially once they get into the upper elementary, middle school and high school, having them take the initiative of designing, planning, implementing the, the garden is a marvelous hands-on project-based learning opportunity that your district couldn't uh, not approve. So that's where we really want to focus on. And you can address a variety of topics in the garden, such as the, the food web or predator prey interactions like we were talking about with the chickadees who needed up to 8,000 caterpillars per brood. But you can also go through the garden as an opportunity for other teaching tools. So let's chat real quick. What are you seeing in this picture? And for those of you who know the answer, especially people like Ellen, you've seen my webinars constantly, don't give away the answer, please. But for those of you who've never seen the picture, what are you looking at? Yes, Jenna, that is a really good point. You can show administrators uh, and staff images of successful educational gardens um, to help, help get them on board. So I don't see, uh, light pollution. That's what Janet is saying is this is light pollution, okay. Yes, and that is the common response of what many people uh, think when they first look at this image. But in fact, this image is not representing light pollution, it's representing citizen science. And every single one of those dots is a checklist submitted of bird observations that have been sent to us at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that's really what I think would be a marvelous tool for the educate uh, for the garden is citizen science. So, what is citizen science? At the lab of ornithology, we like to think of citizen science as a way to put all the uh, the puzzle pieces together and have a better understanding of world issues and understanding of the natural world. So, when we think of citizen science. It's people everywhere who are reporting observations of natural events using basic scientific protocols. And again, that's where all these checklists submitted, every single one of those yellow dots is a checklist submitted of people sharing those bird observations and they were following similar scientific protocols. And it's really developing this partnership between scientists and the community, citizens of the world, to answer real world questions and better understand our natural environment. And that's where I look at uh, the opportunity for students to become scientists in the garden through citizen science projects. And there are projects in every kind of topic imaginable that you can think of. But there are a variety of topics you can do right in your garden. I'm gonna highlight three of those projects and just give you a sampling of what citizen science may look like in your school garden. So the first one I wanna talk about is milkweeds and the opportunity to study monarch butterflies in your school garden. 
And that's where milkweeds is a wonderful garden feature. Now there is a whole blog post on milkweeds in Habitat Network, but for those who aren't familiar, they are providing a, a wonderful nesting opportunity for the monarchs. And there are three different projects that I just pulled up right away. However, there's tons of regional projects uh, around the country to help uh, study monarch populations. One I highly recommend that I'm familiar with is Journey North. There's also Monarch Watch and Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, all of these vary slightly of how you are collecting data on monarchs. Some are simply making observations. I know other projects you are um, raising monarchs. Some of them you are actually catching and tagging monarchs. There's a variety of different projects available. That's one simple project where you're working with your students to help uh, increase the monarch population which is a pollinator population and ultimately helps indicate a healthy garden another citizen science project is habitat network not only does habitat network have a beautiful learning opportunity and educational resource but you can also develop online mapping skills to map and assess your local habitat and it breaks down into the three layers. Using Google Earth, you have the reference map. Uh, you go on the reference map and you create a site outline. This can be a specific garden, or it can be um, a backyard, a garden, your school property, whatever you want. Then you identify the different habitats within that garden. So it could be lawn, it could be pavement, it could be gravel. Um, buildings, whatever. And then once you identify those habitats, you then add objects on top. And so you're mapping where are your native shrubs and trees? Where do you have bird feeders? Where do you have rain barrels, uh, compost pile, etc.? And that's one opportunity where you are helping um, the Nature Conservancy and the Cornell Lab Ornithology better understand correlations uh, around native plants and habitat. And then the final citizen science project opportunity is to study birds. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example of a group of third graders who developed a full inquiry project around their garden to study birds. And so they put out two bird feeders outside of their classroom window. And after a couple of weeks, they realized no birds were visiting their feeders. So they went through a full inquiry project to study why are no birds visiting their feeders? They went through ideas of, could it be the seed type? Could it be the feeder type? Could there be too much sunlight? But ultimately they decided there was not enough cover for those birds. So they decided they needed to improve their habitat and actually attract more bird species. So they participated in citizen science project called eBird. eBird was that, what looked like a light pollution map. That was our eBird citizen science project. It's our largest project we've had observations from every single country in the world and these students were part of that they would go out once a week before classes and count birds in their area to better study what birds are they seeing what birds are in their current habitat and what i like about this that they could have done is that they could have uh, assessed the birds before and after their habitat improvement are they seeing uh, an increased total number of birds or an increased diversity of birds after they're improving their habitat. But once they've studied the birds and what birds are in their area, they then went through the design process of how can we create a beneficial habitat for the birds. When considering your garden, consider multiple canopy levels. Not only did they have low shrubs, they also had a uh, uh, trees and small flowers as well, keeping the flowers, bushes, trees, uh, snags, potentially the multi multiple canopy layers to provide different habitats for the birds. And of course, they also made water, they had feeders, they had a birdhouse, etc. And then they implemented it. They went through the process of developing this native garden outside their window to better provide cover for their birds. And what it led to was they started in the fall. By the springtime, they actually were able to 
produce this garden and the birds came and that was the ultimate success for them was having birds visit their bird garden. And so that's where the ensuring garden success comes in uh, of also thinking about what else can we do of considering location, considering climate, getting staff support, seeking approval. I wanna highlight two other topics in our ensuring garden success. The first one is planning your summer break. This is a topic where, especially for those of you who are in school, that nobody is present in the summer. Think about how you are going to meet the needs of caring for your garden during the summer. Uh, how are you going to water them? What about pest control? Um, if you have a vegetable garden, how can you uh, harvest those vegetables, etc.? cetera? Um, some suggestions we've had are to collaborate and make it a community garden so the community is involved. Others include um, having the parents, maybe two families a week, rotate through the process of maintaining the garden. And especially if your school is large enough, the families only have to do it one time, but they have one designated week where they need to go in, water, harvest anything they need to. They can take home whatever they harvest and eat it. Uh, if it is a vegetable garden, uh, another opportunity is if you have a summer camp or summer school, have them in charge of the garden and use that as an educational tool for them. The final struggle that we've talked about with many teachers is funding. Funding really is the key of garden success because gardens cost money. Though having native plants will help reduce those costs, um, native plants tend to uh, be more successful over a longer period of time, you will still have some general uh, budgets that you will have to consider. So let's just talk quickly for our last few minutes about funding options. The first one is BirdSleuth. We offer several different types of grants available to help support your gardens. The first one is our full garden grant program. You can receive up to $2,000 to support the rehabilitation or creation uh, or expansion of a garden. It doesn't have to be a bird garden either. It can be a vegetable garden, a rain garden, um, a pollinator garden, etc. That will be happening in the fall. So right now we can't provide funds for that, but that does happen in the fall, so stay tuned. Another option we provide is through our um, Habitat Heroes grants. And that's what this page really is, is um, you can apply for one of our Habitat Heroes mini grants, and that's receiving up to $750. That's on a rolling basis uh, throughout the school year. So each month at the end of the month, we'll review applicants and select one or two schools to receive uh, funds to support their habitat improvement projects. This could be gardening, but this can also be um, invasive species removal or participating in a bio blitz, et cetera. So that's a little more lenient. And I'll have Kelly share the links to those grants in the chat window. Um, just a quick highlight of extra resources. Kelly's not gonna share the link to all the resources in the chat window, but they will be in our archive version. Donors Choose right now does have an extra sponsorship where they are partnering with another organization uh, specifically for gardens. So if you can um, participate in Donors Choose, this is a great opportunity. Lowe's, they have a toolbox for education grant. Um, Subaru is partnering with the National Wildlife Federation where you can uh, apply to receive a goodie bag um, from your local Subaru de dealer for garden supplies. Nature Works, again, those are the videos that we had, um, that I showed at the beginning, and they also have their not only educational tools like these videos, they also have lesson plans and a full garden grant. Kids Gardening, they have live webinars that you can join in that are specifically around mostly vegetable gardening and um, the transition from a uh, garden to cafeteria in your school. They also have grants. And then my final one are Master Gardeners. Master Gardeners don't provide funding, but they um, can provide free support in advice and assistance. 
master gardeners to maintain the status of master gardeners they have to dedicate at least 20 hours a year to community service so that is a final opportunity with that i see it's seven o'clock exactly um kelly and i will take any questions you ought to offer but please keep in touch with us you're welcome to email us uh, with any questions you may have for those of you who participated throughout the webinar um, if you'd like you can also receive a letter of completion just email us on the email on the screen birdsleuth at cornell.edu um, that way you can uh, email us and get a letter of completion as well yes janet master naturalists are via the extension offices so that screenshot i had here what you can do this is just through the american horticulture society you can click on the state through this website it will tell you who is your coordinator for all the master gardeners often they are through extension offices through universities and then um, that master gardener you do have to technically get your project approved which is super easy to do and then you can have master gardeners come help your project Okay, I'm going to look through and see if I missed any questions. 